just love this. I love gathering with people who love him, know him, and just, it's not a show. Just want to come here, look him in the eyes, and tell him how great he is. Like the verse today, just fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Life is so good when we fix our eyes on him. Gathering with the church is so good when we all fix our eyes on him. Mm. I was blessed this morning by a couple of you that told me how you applied last week's message and you just all week long were just thinking, let me just dwell, let my mind dwell on what's true, what's honorable, what's right, what's pure, what's lovely, what's excellent, what's praiseworthy. And anytime your mind would start going to something else, you're like, no, no, no. The, 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 the word of God says, let my mind dwell on these things. And uh, I hope that was true of all of you that were here last week, that the word of God wasn't something you heard and you thought, well, I'm, I'm going to apply that one day, but that this week you decided, no, I'm going to fix my eyes. I'm going to dwell on what's true and honorable and right and pure. How'd you do with that? Um, I had an amazing week. I was, it just was a joyful, like nothing really changed. You know, I got a little bit of a funk a couple of weeks ago where just you hear a lot of negative and, and you can just dwell on it. And then it's like nothing's really changed. In fact, things have gotten worse in those areas, but, but I changed, like my joy changed, my focus changed, like nothing robbed me of this elation, this, uh, this high that I have with Jesus. And it was because of the word of God. It's, uh, what we talked about a few weeks ago about being sober minded, clear minded for the sake of our prayers. And then it's dwelling on what's true and right and honorable. And this week, you know, as elders, we just felt like Hebrews 12, 2 was being highlighted. Like, let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Um, and I just, our elder gathering, Rob just made the comment because I just want to hear about Jesus. Like, that's it. Can we just preach about him and how great he is? Because there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. And I don't mean to belittle those things, but I also don't want to belittle God and what happens when we just fix our eyes on him. Like sometimes we get in strategy mode. Well, here's a problem, so we got to fix that problem. So let's fixate on the problem and let's fix our eyes on the problem until we fix the problem. And scripture says, no, get your eyes fixed like blinders where you're just staring at him. Fix your eyes on Jesus. You read those stories in the Old Testament where, you know, you've got this crazy war that's about to happen and God says, send the, the worshipers ahead. Just have them start worshiping me and see what happens. And armies are destroyed through people fixing their eyes on him. And so it's just this belief that he is in control. And uh, I hope you've had a joyful week. And uh, if you did not have a joyful week, I'm here to tell you it's your fault. That's really important for you to understand in this victimized world, that if you did not have joy this week, it was all your fault. Um, you chose not to think about the word of God. You chose not to dwell on what is true and honorable, right and pure. It's not my fault. It wasn't because my sermon wasn't good enough. It wasn't, you know, the worship wasn't good enough. It's your fault. Um, it's your issue. This, 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 this is the way I was brought up. I, I, I didn't grow up in a victim culture. It was just, hey, you, you can choose. I want to do something right now. I want you to imagine. Everyone has an imagination. Try to imagine a cat. Okay, raise your hand if you can imagine a cat. Okay, keep your hands up. I want to make sure everyone, just in case there's someone here that can't 
picture a cat in their head. Okay, now picture, keep your hands up, if you can imagine a hat on top of the cat. Okay, it could be anywhere on the cat. It's just a cat with a hat. You still got that in your head? Now picture that cat also holding a balloon somehow. Okay, we all still got our hand. You're, you're able to do that. Okay, good, put your hand down. Okay, that's proof that you have control over your thoughts. You can think about whatever you want to think about. You want to think about a cat with a hat with a balloon? You can do it. If you want to dwell on what is true, honorable, right, pure, excellent, you can do it. You just choose to dwell on the other stuff. You choose, and we have control. Like at any moment, you can worship him. Okay, no matter what's going on, that's the whole idea of him being your shepherd is he, he, can, he can set a table for you to have a meal with you in front of your enemies. You have enemies, you have all this stuff going on, but you have power over this. So if you don't have the joy of the Lord, it's your fault. You have chosen, you've just proven to me you have control over your mind. You can think whatever you want to think. You know, it's, it's like the last week when I was talking about that guy that got addicted to video games. It's like, you could have taken it out and just ran it over with your car. But you chose to let your marriage deteriorate. You can't sit there and blame, like, well, these video game makers make it so difficult. No, you had the power and you chose the video game over your marriage. That's it. That's all there is to it. God promises us, remember, that, that no temptation has overcome you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He won't let you. God, the one we've been worshiping, he is so, Jesus is so faithful to us. He promised me. He promises me, Francis, I will never let you be tempted beyond what you can handle. So every time you're tempted, you have a way of escape. Anytime a negative thought comes to your mind, you have strength to kick it out and think about me and fix your eyes on me again. And I just, I cling to that. I go, that's the word of God. See, this is not about being an optimist. It's like, well, maybe you're just more naturally optimistic. No, it's I trust the word of God. And the word of God, Romans 8, 28, is not just like a bumper sticker verse. It's I really believe that all things work together for the good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So no matter what happens in life, I, I trust the word of God. Well, you know what? That, that guy crashed into my car. I guess it was God's will. And something good is going to come out of this. You know, Justin was telling us last night, his, his car broke down in the middle of the freeway, you know. I mean, it just stopped. And, uh, you know, but then he got a great talk with the tow truck driver. It just all works out somehow. Everything's got a reason. There's a reason why you're here today. There's a reason why you're going to listen to this particular message. It works all out for the good for those who love him. It's about trusting that. So it's not about being optimistic. It's about trusting what his word says, and it's obeying his commands. When he says, rejoice in the Lord always, it's a command. So you trust his promises, and you obey his commands. Trust and obey. It's an old hymn we used to sing, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. You just trust. You just go, you know what? Everything's going to work out in the end. And it's all for my good somehow. God's going to use this to sanctify me, so it's a good thing. So I'm going to rejoice in the Lord because he tells me to do that always. He tells me I never have to worry. I really believe that. When he says, do not be anxious about anything, I see that command as a command. I go, he doesn't ever want me to worry. These are things I just... I, I, I train my mind, and I don't blame. I just go, it's my choice. I can choose to rejoice right now. I can choose to trust his word that everything's going to work together for my good. I can dwell on what is true 
and honorable and right and pure and excellent. And uh, the enemy is going to keep trying to break this rejoicing spirit. And he's trying to break the worship, break the praise. And so when we get together, we got to keep reminding one another, it's good to praise God right now. He is always worthy of our praise. Let's just keep fixing our eyes on Jesus. Do you believe that there's a God in heaven on his throne right now? And he actually has control of everything. Do you believe that? That he's not worried right now on his throne? There's no anxiety in him? He's in perfect peace. Like, do you believe God worries about anything? No, because he's in control. We worry because we don't have control. There are things I can't control, so you worry about it. You're not supposed to. You just go, well, God is in control. He's not worried. He's in perfect peace. And that's why the Bible says the peace that God has can actually be yours. Like, I can be just as peaceful as God. That's a crazy thought that I don't have to worry. I can have the peace of God. Do you believe he's present with us? Okay, I'll watch. I'm going to do something. Lisa, can you come up here? My wife, Lisa. January will be 30 years. Look at that. <laughs> so cute. So cute. I was thinking of this morning. Wow, she's so cute. Cute, oh, honey. She's so cute. Okay, sit down. That's enough. I imagine that moment, and I, I go, you know what? If I ask Lisa to come up here, I bet you she'll come up here and just hug me. It's nice. It's nice cuddling with my wife. Now, do I have the same faith in the presence of Jesus? That if I go, Jesus, come here. Like, just, just be with me. Just be one with me. Just commune with me. Like, I just, you, you said, like, this is, this is why you went to the cross so that we could be there. Is it just as real to you as that was? I know I can say, Lisa, come up here. Come be with me. And there's, there's a real person that's going to come on the stage and a real person who's going to hold me. And do I believe that about God Almighty? That he is a real person and his promises. I do believe, like what Justin was saying, that the joy sent before him, that at least a portion of that is his desire to commune with us. That he wants that. So when I come up and I take of the bread and the cup and I go, God, I just want to commune with you in every way possible. When Justin is praying, going, God, we want everything we can of you. Do you believe like that the reality of a person who's sitting on his throne, all powerful, but he's also omnipresent. He's somehow in this room with us. That he, he's a literal person who comes and, and looks at me, his creation, and go, oh, this is my inheritance. That he actually wants to be one with you. And he says, look, abide in me and I will abide in you. If you abide in me and, and my words abide in you, then ask whatever you wish will be given to you. Like, do you believe in this God who wants to abide with you? Just as much as when I asked Lisa to come up here. Do you believe God is so real? And he answers your prayer. And you say, God, come near. I just want to read something that he said in his word. 
Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Can we just stand as I read these words? And can you just clear your mind of everything else? We have power over our minds. Clear your mind of everything else. We're about to hear from the very words of God. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. God, may you bless your word this morning. May you cause us to take root in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So we are surrounded. He goes, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, therefore, this is, this is Hebrews 12 and Hebrews 11. You know, you guys know that's that chapter where he just shows all the people through history that have lived by faith, believed in God, made it to the end. And he says, since you have so many examples, Because we have so many examples of those who made it, the point is, you can do it too. Now here's the problem in the church. Sometimes we make heroes of these people in the Bible. Almost like superheroes. You know, it's like, well, I can't do that. I'm not Spider-Man. I can't do that. I'm not Superman. I can't do that. I'm not Moses. I can't do that. I'm not Abraham. I'm not Mary. And we, we, we look at these, well, that was Elijah. Well, that was Paul. That was Deborah. It, whoever it is, you, you kind of, you kind of put them out there like untouchable. But that was not the point of Romans 11 for you to go, well, yeah, that was Noah. I mean, Noah, you're just good with boats. You know, like, no, he's just a guy. You know, Moses, oh, he was just a good leader. No, he's the one that wanted to bring Aaron because he couldn't talk. And that was, that was a stupid idea. Look where Aaron took him. That's the guy that led him into making the golden calf. So he's a terrible leader, terrible speaker. The point of it was he believed. These were not, we, we kind of do the opposite of what scripture was meant for. We go, well, that was Abraham. Father Abraham, he had many sons. You know, you just go on and on like, oh, I could never be him. I could never be him. But the point of Hebrews 11 was these were normal people. Samson was normal. He was terrible. But the end, it was like that faith. It was just, that's the point. These witnesses are not for us to go, I could never be like him. No, it's because of these witnesses that actually made it. We're supposed to look and go, wow, I have no excuse. It's crazy that we would use them as excuses when the point is, no, you have no excuse. Look at this great cloud of witnesses. Look at all these people that made it. You got this. Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting too, we're talking about 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10 kind of shows you all these failures too. And the point is, is the point of the failures is for you to go, oh, I don't want to become like them. The point of Hebrews 11 is, oh, I do want to be like them. But again, it's like this human nature thing where we, those who fail, sometimes when someone in ministry fails, we almost use it as an excuse again, like, well, if he didn't make it, how am I going to make it? If she didn't make it, how am I ever going to walk with Jesus? How am I ever going to live a faithful life? <laughs> Guys, do you understand what the scriptures are doing? They're just pointing out, here's the guys that made it, here's the ones that didn't. 
You want to be like them, you don't want to be like them. And so there could come a day where I fail you miserably, Rob fails you miserably, Sarah fails you miserably, Justin, Rachel, Lisa, whatever. We all fail. It's, it's, it could happen. But don't take it as an excuse. Well, Francis didn't even make it. You just go, wow, I don't want to be like Francis. He blew it. He blew it. That's what you look at, 1 Corinthians 10. Well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Hebrews 11. Ooh, I want to be like that. Oh, I want to have faith. It's, it's a choice. It's, it's for us. And so because we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, he goes, let's lay, let us, okay, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so, cl- which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Okay, don't use all these people as excuses. Use them as examples of, oh, I I want to be like them. I don't want to be like them. These people made it. Let them be my example. These people failed. That's a negative example. I don't want to do that. That's all it's for. And then let us lay aside. Okay, this has been a running theme. Worry about yourself. Okay, This is me. I have a choice. I'm not going to blame it on the people who failed, and I'm not going to make superheroes of the people who made it. I just have to lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. I, I think it's significant in this verse that he says, let us also lay aside every weight and sin. Like we, we know what sin is. We talk about sin. Scripture talks about sin. So you, we got to lay that aside. You know, this, it talks about the sin that clings so closely I mean, the idea here is of a runner. Back then, I, not to be too graphic, but they would run naked. Um, that was the idea in this race, was just like, man, I don't want these. Because, you know, it's not like they had Speedos. They just had these cloths that were covering. You try to run, and the idea was you're tripping, and it's entangling. You just get rid of that and run. That's the way we need to run our lives. That's where we got to live, is just get rid of the things that will entangle you, like sin, and that cling so closely. He goes, but he also says, lay aside every weight. It's separate from sin here. The weights and the sin. A lot of times there's things in our lives that we hold on to, and in our mind we go, well, it's not sin, Well, it's not sin to swim with a bowling ball. It's not sin. It's just dumb. You know, and in the same way, there are things in our lives. When God has marked out a race, okay, think about this. God has given some, he goes, let us run with endurance. The race that is set before us. Okay, worry about yourself. What is the race that is set out for you? You can't go, well, it's easy. It's, it's easy for Jarrell. You know, he's got a great wife. Da, 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 da. Well, that was his race. You've got a race. Like, there's something, Jarrell, you're supposed to do that I'm not called to do. And I can't compare I just go, okay, there's a race that's set out before me, and I've got to run it with endurance. I can't worry about the people who failed and make an excuse out of that. I can't worry about the superhero ones and try to make them sound like they're better than me. At the end of the day, I can choose to lay aside the weights. You know, that's where I have to go, gosh, Lord, is there anything I have to have? Because that's a weight. I could say, you know, I, if I have to have a nice car or, you know, a car within five years, or, you know, not, not older than five years, that's a weight. I don't have to have that. 
Because then I get, I always got to make enough money to have that kind of car. Or you just got to get to a point where it's like, God, I, I'll live off of anything. I'll wear anything. I'll lead anything. I just want to follow you. I don't want anything to encumber me. I don't want to hold on to this bowling ball as I swim. It's not wrong. It's not like a hardcore sin. It's just like, God, I'm good. I'm good. You're, you're enough for me. I'm content with this. I'm not going to covet all of these things. See, once there's things in your life where you go, I have to have this, it becomes a weight. And you can always justify, go, well, it's not a sin. Yeah, but he says, lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily entangles so that we can run this race that he set before us. Okay? Don't make excuses. Well, this guy is not running his race very fast. She's hardly even running. He laid a race for you and run with endurance. You've got the examples of those who made it and those who didn't. Now, so you run looking to Jesus. Or some of your Bibles say, fit, and that's the way I memorize it, fixing your eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. I love this. That means it's like having blinders on. You know, those horses that have the blinders where they can just look at, you know, the finish line or whatever they're supposed to look at. They're not wandering out. Just fix your eyes. Just look at Jesus. Stare at him. The author and perfecter of our faith. I want us to do that right now. Just know that Jesus is here. Just like Lisa's here. Can I, I can have her come to me. Jesus is here. Thank him for being the author of your faith. Think back to when you started believing. Jesus set that up for you. Acts 17 says that he, he, des, he des, decided when you would be born, where you were going to be born, so that you would find your way towards him and find him. So who set that up? It's Jesus. Scripture says he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him. So don't give credit to your youth pastor, your parents. One person was the author of your faith. One person decided, I want him, I want her. I'm going to pour my grace on him. I'm going to let her know how much I love her. He is the author. Thank him. Thank him. He used other people, but it was him. Why are you sitting in this room still worshiping him at this age? Because he started something in you. Why are you still here? Because he's the perfecter of your faith too. That he who began a good work is faithful to complete it. Thank him for being the perfecter. Thank him that he's the one. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in his presence, in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. He's the perfecter. This is why we can't blame anyone and we can't give credit to anyone. He started it. He's going to finish it. We can't blame anyone if we're not close to God. God's the one that's going to perfect your faith. That doesn't mean that the church body doesn't have a role in that. We all have gifts to equip one another. But at the end of the day, I, I love that old A.W. Tozer quote. He goes, every man is as close to God as he wants to be. 
Why are you not close to God right now? Because you don't want to be. You could choose to focus on him. You just choose not to. Don't blame it on me. Don't blame it on your pastor. Don't blame it on your parents. I'm not saying that we can't do things that hurt you and discourage you from your faith. That's absolutely true. But at the end of the day, God is the author of your faith. He started this, and he'll finish it. So you guys can all let me down. I can let you down. But at the end of the day, I know who I believe. And he started something in me. It's in me. I remember when we had this... uh, men's home in San Francisco for people coming off addiction or people coming out of prison. You know, that's where Rob started out, right when he got out of prison. That's how we got to know each other. But I remember one of our leaders looking at this guy who was an addict, and he says, you know, the problem right now is I want your sobriety more than you want your own sobriety. And when that happens, it never works. And sometimes as a leader, it's like we can want you to have intimacy with God more than you want to have intimacy with God, and that doesn't work. There's got to be something in you that wants this, that desires it, that can't blame it on anyone else. It's like, no, God started something in me, and I'm rooted and grounded in his love. Like, I want this. I want, it's not, oh man, Justin didn't lead communion real well. What are you even talking about? Didn't, did you come in here just desiring the communion, desiring that? He's the author. He's the perfecter. And so when other people fail you, that's okay. Just look at that as an example of what you don't want to be. And go, God, thank you, thank you. Thank you that you're the author. Thank you that you're the perfecter who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So beautiful. Just fix your eyes on Jesus and tell him, God, that is amazing that for the joy set before you, you endured the cross. Like, why did Jesus go to the cross? There was something he desired. And part of that, again, like we want to be careful that the word of God doesn't say it, spell it out specifically, but in other passages, It just made it so clear that he's so loved and that we are his inheritance, the riches of his glorious inheritance, that somehow he sees us as his glorious inheritance. And there was a joy in that, just like when he's praying to the Father, these these disciples you gave me, I want them to be where I am. I want to be with them forever. There is something in Jesus eagerly wanting to be with them, going, oh, I can't go, but I'm going to come and I'm going to take you to where I'm at and I'm preparing a place for you. We're going to be together. Okay, so have joy in this. It's coming. And he's saying like that, that joy that was set before him enabled him to endure. Like was just to look at Jesus, go, wow, he made it through. And he hated, he despised the shame of the cross. you got to understand, despising the shame. So, Jesse, either Jesse, both Jesses, if I came up and I just spit in each of your faces, how would you like that? No, not a whole lot. You'd have to think about that cat again. It's like, okay, okay, cat, hat, balloon. Um, you know, or you'll get angry. Like, it's just, it's just the worst. I, it's never happened to me yet, um, except sometimes some people just talk and they spit when they talk. But other than that, I've never been spit in my face. I can just imagine, that's not great. I would hate it. And, and you got to understand, sometimes we look at Jesus Like, well, it was different for him because he's the son of God. No, John explains he's the word and he became flesh and he emptied himself. 
Philippians 2 says. He took the form of a baby. He actually had to grow. The Bible even describes it. He grew in stature. He grew in wisdom. He grew in his understanding. He had to learn. You know, sometimes when we think of Jesus, we almost like, oh, he probably didn't have to go to school. He just came out of Mary's womb. It's like, E equals MC squared. You know, it's just, no. He grew, he grew, he grew. He was fully human. And so that means don't think of the cross differently than if you had to go to the cross. Don't think that if someone took a whip to your back, it would hurt you. And when you think of Jesus, it was a little bit different because he's the son of God. No, he felt it all. He felt it all like you would feel it all. And he despised the shame of it. The shame of becoming a curse So it's not just the pain, but the in Galatians 3, verse 13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. He redeemed us by becoming a curse. That's what Jesus did, and he despised that. That's why many theologians believe that when he cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Most through history have believed that at that moment, he truly was, became the curse, took on our sin to where the God, the Father, even had to turn away. And it's like, ah, I'm just filled with all the sins of the world, and I'm just hanging on this tree as a curse for the world. The very people that I came to save are mocking me, spitting on me. They just nailed a, you know, my, my hand to this piece of wood after beating the heck out of me. So much pain. And now, my God, my God, why are you turning away from me? And he says, fix your eyes on that Savior of yours who endured the cross for the joy set before him. Fix your eyes. That's our God who loves us so much. That's your God. That's why we rejoice in him. That's why we fix our eyes. Because who else would you want to fix your eyes on? Who else do we want to focus on? In fact, let's just worship him right now. Okay? He's in this room. He's here with us. He endured the cross for you. He despised the shame of the cross. He was... He was in that garden, like, before he even went to the cross, he's sweating drops of blood because he knew what was coming. And he said, God, is there any other way? But he endured it for us, and he's here right now. The author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus is amazing. He is always worth praising. Stare at him right now. Ask him to come to you. He's real. He's real. Give us eyes, God. And we just want to worship and stare at you right now, Jesus.